um, uh, uh, Guy, uh, the uh, state Medicaid director is going to fill in for uh, Commissioner Barton Reeves, who's unable to attend today. I appreciate that. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I'd like to welcome the appropriations and the Human Services Committee uh, to our meeting today. Today, we're going to have a um, a meeting and then a, a public hearing and then a vote on movement on Appendix K, Emergency Preparedness and Response Amendments uh, for Home and Community-Based Services, Medicaid waivers operated by DDS and administered by Department of Social Services. So before we get into it, I'm going to ask my uh, colleagues, uh, Senator Berthel, do you have any comments this morning? Yes, uh, good morning, Madam Chair. Actually, I'd like to ask for a point of personal privilege, if I might. Go right ahead, sir. Thank you, Madam Chair. So um, to my colleagues on the committee and those in the audience, we have uh, a very special moment we'd like to acknowledge this morning. Uh, Representative Anthony Nolan uh, retired yesterday from his service with the New London Police Department after 23 years and 23 days. And he did it. He made it out. God bless. Congratulations, Anthony. Congratulations. Thank you as well for your former uh, uh, service, uh, military service, and and, uh, uh, and and as a veteran of our great armed forces. You are a, a, a true role model for a whole bunch of us. And I, I thank you for that. And congratulations. Con congratulations. You, congratulations, Representative. So now that you retired from that job, that means you have extra time on this job, right? So I can look forward to assigning some really good stuff to you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Representative Gilchrist. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just hope everyone had a nice weekend and ready to get going. Great. Let's see. Do we have any of our other co-chairs on? Who did? Oh, there he is. <laughs> Rep. Representative Lesser. I uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Just uh, glad to be here and uh, excited to get into it. Okay, thank you. All right, let's get going. Great. Commissioner Chef and at all, go right ahead, sir. Good morning, Senators Austin and Lesser, Representatives Walker and Gilcrest, and honorable members of the Appropriations and Human Services Committees. My name is Guy Wolston. I'm the Medicaid Director at the Department of Social Services, DSS. In accordance with the provisions of Section 17.8 of the Connecticut General Statutes, we are here today to seek your support for the Appendix K Emergency Preparedness and Response Amendment for three home and community-based services, HCBS, Medicaid waivers, operated by DDS uh, and administered by DSS. I'm pleased to be here with Commissioner Jordan A. Shah, Commissioner of the Department of Developmental Services, and other members of the DDS and DSS teams to assist in answering any questions you may have. I will now turn it over to Commissioner Shah to provide details on the request before you today. Thank you, Guy. And uh, before I proceed through testimony, uh, uh, Commissioner Barton Reeves, uh, sense of regrets. Um, due to a conflict, wasn't able to attend. And I appreciate Guy uh, sitting in for her uh, at my side today. Uh, so thank you, Guy. Uh, DSS and DDS seek your support for the Appendix K Emergency Preparedness and Response Amendments to be effective upon approval by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, which I'll refer to as CMS, uh, as we discussed today. As allowable under Appendix K, the preceding modifications are being requested retroactively to February 1st, 2023, upon approval by CMS. The three HCBS Medicaid waivers operated by DDS are as follows, our Comprehensive Supports Waiver, Individual and Family Support Waiver, Employment and Day Supports Waiver. Appendix K amendments are temporary and expire six months following the expiration of the federal public health emergency. The federal public health emergency is scheduled to end May 11th, 2023. CMS has clarified that all Appendix K modifications must be submitted uh, prior to May 11th, 2023 to be considered. 
The Appendix K modifications offer today adjust amendments already approved by the legislature and CMS to ensure funds provided through Section 9817 of the uh, American Rescue Plan Act, ARPA, of 2021 can be expended timely within the defined ARPA spend period through March of 2025. Uh, Home and Community-Based Services ARPA allows uh, allowed states to leverage funding from a temporary increase to their federal match uh, for certain Medicaid expenditures. The funding can then be reinvested into services that improve, expand, or enhance the state's home and community-based services. I'm going to read briefly a short list of those uh, uh, changes uh, that we have requested through the amendment. Uh, uh, the first change, uh, number one, creates incentive-based outcome payments to any qualified residential or day provider, as described in the application, that sub uh, submits a transition plan and is approved by DDS. Two, creates incentive-based outcome payments to any qualified residential or day provider as described in the application that transitions a waiver participant from a congregate residential setting towards a more integrated community-based setting or a waiver participant from a congregate day setting towards a more community-based employment setting. Uh, number three, creates incentive-based outcome payments to any qualified residential or day provider as described in the application. Uh, creates an incentive, uh, number four, creates an incentive payment for any DDS qualified provider that completes the National Corps Indicator uh, Workforce Survey. Number five, uh, creates an incentive payment for DDS qualified providers that meet the criteria of training expe uh, expectations consistent with several uh, professional accreditation certification entities. Uh, number six, it creates an incentive payment for any DDS qualified provider that meet the articulated criteria for training expectations with regards to technology first or other such certifications. Number seven, creates temporary increases for specific employment and residential waiver services authorizations covered under DDS waivers. DDS is confident that these expanded opportunities provide for the financial fortitude to allow individuals to live and work in the most integrated setting of their choice. Home and Community-Based Services ARPA money was, has, uh, ARPA plan has created a unique opportunity to transform the DDS system with a specific focus on independence and community integration. These amendments reflect changes requested by stakeholder members that participated in the DDS ARPA committees. These committees provide feedback and suggestions from, for, for improvements related to ARPA initiatives. Uh, the stakeholders have included DDS families, providers, staff, and advocates. Pursuant to uh, Connecticut Statute 17BA, a notice of intent for the application K emergency preparedness and response amendments uh, was posted for public review and comment in the Connecticut Law Journal, as well as on both departments' websites beginning March 13th for a period of 30 days. There were two comments submitted in response to the notice of intent. A letter notifying the committees of cognizance of the department's intent to amend Appendix K was transmitted on April 17th 2023. The departments respectfully request that the committees approve the Appendix K Emergency Preparedness and Response Amendments as described. Staff from DSS and DDS are happy to answer any questions that you may have. And thank you for indulging me reading the testimony that was pretty specific and normally I'd summarize, but I appreciate that opportunity. And it's good to see you all this morning. Uh, Representative Walker, I complete my testimony and ready for any questions. Thank you, sir. And thank you for, for the brevity, but also for the for the at, at least the the points, can you just um, explain to the the members here today the benefit of waivers for Medicaid funding? Maybe Guy could do that just so that we all understand exactly why we do these things. So, um, I, I, and Guy, feel free to add any uh, texture to this that that you think is appropriate. Uh, the federal waiver programs allow states to um, uh, uh, receive revenue from services provided under certain definitions. The purpose of the waiver is to waive access to institutional care as, uh, and, and choose uh, to receive supports in a home and community-based setting. Um, and our uh, participants in the waivers have done that. Uh, and we, we, we generate in Connecticut roughly 50 cents for every dollar spent in revenue. Uh, there are several categories that are not right at 50%, some a little higher, uh, and some services we provide we don't get a match on, but pretty much use the figure 50, 50 cents on every dollar. So the, the waivers are to take advantage of our ability to utilize dollars in the areas that we have specific needs in, in, in the state. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, Senator that, thank you. Okay. Um, so in the home and community-based waiver, 
Um, one of the issues that I that I, I asked you about, and I just want to make sure we get it on record, was that if we move somebody from an institutional setting and move them into a smaller um, uh, environment that is le less restrictive, that if at any time there is a need for them to move back into that, it would not be obstructed. Is that correct? Uh, that is largely correct. I want to just uh -oh. be clear. The largely just, doesn't make me happy. <laughs> so, so I, well, no, it, uh, there's a statute on the books with regards to admissions at Southbury. Yeah. Uh, so that anyone who participated in any of this activity who received benefit of community-based services uh, discharged from Southbury um, would have access to more comprehensive or other types of services later, but not at Southbury. So I just want to make sure okay. that, that that is clear. So the the the, the, the main focus in that is that we want to lower the number of uh, clients in Southbury, maybe move them into different settings. Doesn't necessarily mean that they have to stay in them, but we would not move them back to Southbury. Okay. Correct. That, that one I can, I can, because when you say largely, that made me very nervous. That, that, well, I, 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 I try not to speak in absolutes and Southbury is often an exception in, in what yes, I have to say. Is. And I just it's wanted been an to exception point that out. For a long time. So thank you. Thank you, sir. Are there any questions from my colleagues? Uh, I'm I'm going to start with the chairs first. Rep Senator Brinkel, Senator Lesser. I thank you, uh, Commissioner. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, in um, the uh, the waiver amendment, seemed to seek to move folks away from uh, congregate settings to more independent living arrangements, which could be of enormous benefit to higher um, to, to, well to to, to folks with less acute conditions uh, and want to make sure that uh, in doing so, the department doesn't see um, a drop in the level of care or the number of beds available for folks with with uh, more serious conditions or more acute needs. Can you speak to that? Uh, good morning, Senator Lesser. Good to see you. Uh, so part of our agreement through the waiver uh, process in, in what the CMS would refer to as maintenance of effort is we we can't decrease um, we can't decrease the way in which we're addressing needs. We can address them in different ways. So uh, part of the purpose for the engagement we're doing now with transforming the system is to provide people. We, we used to have a very limited menu of uh, opportunities, and families and individuals often look to group homes as the solution, regardless of their level of acuity. Uh, in the last 10 years, we've expanded options and we continue to expand options that would allow somebody who previously felt they needed a 24 hour, seven day a week setting in a group home uh, to be afforded the same level of care, the same level of support, address all their needs, but outside of a comprehensive setting like that. Uh, so um, supported living settings, uh, supportive housing settings, community companion homes. Uh, we have a wide variety of ways in which we can address people's needs that don't need to be met in an institutional setting or at a group home. Uh, and so none of this is an intent to uh, reduce um, uh, our ability to meet individuals' needs uh, regardless of setting. I hope that answered the question. Only but I, I, it doesn't, it doesn't. So I understand what you're saying, but I, I obviously there's a, there's a continuum out there of folks who need the department services, uh, and some have uh, greater needs than others, and some are not able to live in, in an independent setting. Uh, so is there going to be a reduction in the number, uh, in the overall number of uh, congregate setting beds through these, this waiver process? Uh, it is not our intent necessarily to, it isn't a plan to close group homes um, and reduce uh, those opportunities. Some of the plans submitted uh, to date do talk about restructuring, restructuring and moving, uh, closing some group homes or repurposing some group homes in their transition plans. Uh, but the intent is not to uh, decrease those, uh, the opportunity for comprehensive settings or for people who need those supports and services to be able to access them. So this isn't a plan to, to, to do away with group homes or institutional care. Uh, this is a, a plan to try and um, uh, maximize the number of opportunities we can provide uh, in hope to provide more services to more people within the same number of, of dollars appropriated by the legislature. Okay, uh, thank you. And uh, I'll turn it back to you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Any, um, just make sure, I just want to make sure that the, the, the chair is first. Um, okay. 
Start. We'll start with Jay, uh, Representative Case. Haven't seen you in a long time. Welcome back, sir. Good to see you, Madam Chair. Um, so just a few quick questions and looking at Appendix K and seeing, you know, we talk about, is this like a modifying getting out of the ARPA dollars and finishing up what's there? So um, the, the uh, uh, representative case, the uh, ARPA dollars uh, were in, awarded in a short period of time and we made some pretty general uh, requests for how those dollars would be allocated. And it, at the time of that application, there was limited stakeholder input uh, because we had a very short window uh, to submit that application. But knowing that we had the flexibility to engage uh, with stakeholders um, after approval, these recommendations are recommended by stakeholders within the community to modify. So it's not an increase in expenditure. There's no request for an increase in appropriation, uh, but to modify uh, the way we articulated the dollars in the original plan in a way that one, uh, we'll make sure that we can get the dollars in the hands of the people that need them, and two, uh, provide them in the manner in which they can utilize them best. And okay, and so I see also it, it's, is this, this is retroactive to February 1st, 2023? That is correct. That would allow, and, and I'm gonna, if you'll indulge me, I'm gonna ask a couple of my staff uh, to join me to, uh, to help explain that in a little better detail. And I'm, I'll ask Krista Ostaszewski and Nick Gerard to join me if they will. Please make sure before you go into your explanation, you just identify yourself for the people out there listening. Thank you. Turn on the mic. Hi, Nicholas Gerard, Department of Developmental Services. So basically this amendment allows us to go retro to February 1st, as just mentioned. And what we are attempting to do is maximize revenue during that time. So. Throughout ARPA, there is money that can be reimbursed and non-reimbursable through the feedback we got through stakeholders. We've identified opportunities to reimburse things that we want to do as part of this plan anyways, but can now maximize and get 50% of the revenue on. Okay, I, I understand that. And I, I just are you, sure. are you, you want to go through me again? Through you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. It's been a while on this committee. Um, so... And then this ends, it says there's there's two things here, uh, approved March 17, 2022, but it's six months after the health emergency is over, or it says also something in here about 2025. Yeah, you do it, Krista. For you, Madam Chair. Good morning. I'm Krista Ostaszewski. I'm the health management administrator at DDS. So representative case, this is, um, this is all related to the ARPA spending plan. Um, which essentially is an opportunity for us to leverage additional federal dollars. Um, the timeline in which those dollars could be spent are through March 2025. But the opportunity to provide modifications to how we spend those dollars can be done through the Appendix K process, which is why we're here. Um, and we can actually allow for there to be retroactive modifications. Um, but the only way we can do that retroactively is through the Appendix K process. So Appendix K is an emergency preparedness application. Um, and because the public health is ending on the federal level on May 11th, we have, um, we have only a limited amount of time to make those changes through Appendix K. Once the Appendix K process ends, will only be able to make modifications through our permanent waiver authorities through 2025. So there's a few different pieces to this puzzle, but that's essentially why we're here going through the Appendix K process so we can allow for some retroactive coverage, but it's all related to the ARPA spending dollars. Perfect, thank you. Through you, Madam Chair, one more, or two more comments, uh, if I can, just to make sure. So when this ends in 2025, these are one-time expenditures that's not gonna end up within your budget. Am I correct on that? The uh, thank you for the question, Representative Case. Uh, uh, both Secretary McCaw uh, and Secretary Beckham made it very clear in working with both DSS and DDS that any uh, planning and expenditures through ARPA that we do through the spend period would not obligate either the administration or the legislature for an increased appropriation at the end of uh, the spend plan in March of 2025. Uh, there may be ways that we uh, are able to articulate it that repurpose dollars internally that we may spend money differently uh, after 20, uh, March 2025 uh, than we do now, but without any change in our appropriation. We've, we've made that promise to the administration. 
uh, to the secretary uh, that we would not obligate them for any further uh, increase in appropriation based on the ARPA spend plan. Thank you. And to you, Madam Chair, I just want to say thank you. Uh, you know, we want to maximize what we can do with this population. I think that we will also see through this session that there'll be some stuff coming out of the legislature that will even help even more. So we look forward to maximizing what we can do and, and make sure that we don't lose group home space because we know that there are people on the waiting list that want to get in. And I think you'll see some things that are moving forward that will help even farther than what this is doing today. Thank you, Representative Case. And I'll, I'll tell you, when, with the application in mind, we were very, uh, with the application submitted and before you today, we were mindful of uh, the, the speaker's intent, the legislature's intent with regards to House Bill 5001 um, and wanted to ensure that anything included in this amendment is consistent with the spirit of that bill, uh, should it pass, and uh, also consistent with the, the vision and mission of the department. Great, and thank you for all you do. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, and yes, it will pass. Um, next, Representative Nuccio. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, and I, I just want to follow up to, to, and make sure that I understand this based off of the questions that Representative Case just asked. This is a waiver for us to be able to spend ARPA dollars. Is that correct for you, Madam Chair? Go yeah, right this ahead. is specific to the ARPA um, initiative uh, by the Center for Medicaid Services. This is not, um, uh, this doesn't amend our permanent waivers in any way. Correct. Okay. Um, Go right ahead. Matt. Thank you. Um, so do you know how much this will, this anticipated waiver would save us in ARPA dollars as you're doing it retro? I, I believe I heard you said. So if it goes back retro, do you know how much money this would free up in the ARPA um, dollars that were allocated to you for this? I'm gonna ask Nick to answer that. And um, uh, and if you want to react, make sure we're answering the right question, you can feel free. So this waiver helps us generate more revenue. It doesn't change the ARPA spend that we originally asked for. So what this waiver would do is allow us to recover approximately 14 and a half million extra dollars back from February 1st, all the way through the end of the ARPA period. Okay, and those dollars will then also have to be used specifically for this same type of service? So that would be federal revenue that could be added to the general fund and then use like the regular re revenue that goes to the general fund from the typical waivers. So the revenue would then be added to the general fund. It would not go back necessarily to this program or for increasing um, availability in homes. Correct. The original ARPA dollars is what's used for these initiatives, and then any revenue generated from those ARPA dollars goes to the general fund. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, Representative Hughes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And through you, just a few clarifying questions. So these incentive-based outcome payments, um, they're, they're payments to already existing providers for already existing services. Is that correct? They are additional payments to existing uh, providers, some of them uh, with regards to services, some of them with regards to staff development. So at least uh, two of the seven changes we've recommended uh, provide incentives for staff development with regards to training and certification. Uh, as the legislature uh, often does is engaged with the Alliance and our provider network. Uh, you've heard about some of their struggles to um, uh, make those investments in staff and this gives them an opportunity to do just that. Uh, to invest in their staff, uh, to provide, uh, to, to learn some new things, to provide a certification for them, to recognize them as professionals, and in hopes to uh, best retain them uh, within the private service sector. Excellent. Um, and you also spoke about um, the D DDS ARPA uh, committees with stakeholders. Were there any um, DDS clients on that committee to uh, I, I heard you say families, um, but did you have any self-determination um, folks besides the advocates on that committee? Uh, thank you, and thank you for um, recognizing a, a poor omission on our yeah. part in providing testimony, but yes. Um, I work closely with a group of self-advocates that are employed by the department, uh, as well as engaging with self-advocates throughout the state. Uh, and there has been self-advocate representation in those stakeholder groups. Uh, their uh, motto is nothing about us without us, and we do our best to adhere to that. And I appreciate the question. Uh, quite Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. And um, finally, I think I'm following my colleagues' line of questioning. So this uh, generating more revenue, uh, $14.5 that extends to March 2025, even though the um, 
ARPA health emergency ends May whatever. Is that correct? Uh, yes, Representative, like, that is correct. Okay, that's all. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Representative McCarty. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and welcome, Commissioner, and your staff. Um, following along with what Representative Hughes uh, talked about with the, um, it's called the incentive-based outcome payments, I noticed you've listed quite a few of those. And just for my own clarification, so what a provider could actually um, take advantage of that and receive multiple incentive payments, is that correct? That is correct, uh, yes. Okay, that's great. And then just on that survey, would you just comment, um, do the providers receive that? Have they received the National Core Indicator uh, survey? And I noticed they would receive an incentive payment. It looked to me like it was something that you might be able to do easily. To, uh, to so, receive. so it, it's not necessary, depending on the size of your organization, it's not necessarily an easy report uh, to uh, complete. Uh, particularly with the workforce crisis you've heard about from our providers. Uh, we've had a volunteer participation at varying percentage levels uh, for five years or more. Um, I, I've lost track, but we've been involved with that, the, the wage survey portion of the National Core Indicators for, for a while. This allows us uh, to provide them additional revenue uh, in, uh, for the, in, in return for their effort of completing that survey, which we think is really important to uh, both for them and for you and for the administration to understand uh, what their turnover rates look like as compared to regional and national averages, what their uh, rate of pay uh, it compares to both regionally and nationally uh, and vacancy rates. It, it, it's a pretty comprehensive report, but time consuming to fill out, absorb, take some energy. Uh, and so we're hoping this will increase our participation um, uh, without creating an unfunded mandate, uh, which is something I think you hear about from uh, the Alliance often. So this would be a funded, not a mandate, but hopefully a, an incentivized way to increase our participation in that survey. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Representative Nee, Dathan. <clears throat> Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thank you um, to DDS and DSS for coming today. This is really great. Um, I am very excited about these incentive-based payments because I do believe it's really going to help our workforce issues that we have in our state. Um, so I appreciate the agencies um, really addressing this. Just wanted to ask the question, um, with these incentive payments, do you think, um, is there any sort of feeling that we'll be able to address the wait list um, for uh, DDS um, uh, services or, or DSS services with these payments through you, Madam Chair? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, yes, is the, is the short answer to the question. Uh, specifically in the areas of incentives for people, uh, for agencies looking to um, either uh, create a transition plan with the intent, the deliberate intent of removing somebody from the wait list or uh, for creating capacity within their existing comprehensive service structure for people to be considered at a later date uh, within that transition. Um, so I think there's a number of ways that that starts to work on that. It, 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 some of the other spending within ARPA, not necessarily articulated in those incentives, uh, but uh, consistent with the rest of our plan, allows for some flexibility and creativity on behalf of the providers to try different approaches to service delivery that we think will expand. The I'm on the meeting now. Okay. Okay. <laughs> That will uh, allow us to continue the, uh, expand the continuum of supports and provide supports to more people uh, by creating more cost-effective ways. Not more cost-effective does not mean less service. Uh, more cost-effective does not mean meeting less needs uh, through the use of technology, through the use of some uh, supportive housing structures, through enhancing some of our existing models. We would su support the same level of need for those individuals, and in, with the intent of trying to support more of them within our current appropriation. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Kushner. In terms of, I mean, it's difficult to quantify, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty certain, um, for uh, DDS. Do you have any idea um, about like sort of geographical focus of folks that might be um, helped by, by these um, sort of incentive payments? 
and, and the same question would go to DSS as well for the autism waiver. So, uh, as 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 we've discussed, right, Dathan, there are certainly uh, concentrated areas uh, within the state where services are are more often provided. Uh, often related to uh, where people moved uh, post deinstitutionalization, whether that was uh, Seaside, uh, Mansfield, uh, 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 our Meriden campus. You know, there are a number of places where we get concentrated around there. The, the governor's budget uh, proposal all includes things outside of this that we think are beneficial to some of the areas where there is less service provision than others in terms of enhancing public transportation and in terms of enhancing uh, the ability uh, uh, to provide affordable housing. Uh, those, um, and, and additional investments in, in workforce uh, development. Those three tenants in the governor's budget pair well with our intent in ARPA um, and serve well the intent of 5001 at the same time. Uh, they're, they're all integrated or, or connected in some way in a Venn diagram and all very important. Uh, I think in our conversations, uh, I've, I've tried to be clear uh, that um, our ability to ameliorate the wait list uh, will depend largely on our private providers and their ability to staff uh, the supports needed. And so those initial investments uh, need to be in that staff development area, staff procurement area, uh, to pro uh, in provider stability area in order for us to bear fruit on the other um, uh, issues we look to address both through uh, our ARPA transformation plan as well as uh, those things articulated within House Bill 5001. Um, Mr. Walshen, can you uh, comment on DSS, please? Sure. Thank you, Representative. Um, and I want to make sure I understood the the question. So the question was: Is there will there be a geographic focus of the efforts? Is that exactly? Great. Um, I, uh, it's a great question. Uh, when we develop and, and the um, the Appendix K that you all approved last month is not subject to today's hearing, but when we thought about our spending plan on the DSS side, we really were thinking about how to support people across the state. We were not trying to pick winners and losers with certain certain geographies. It is true that some of the some of the supports that you approved last month when we met um, might disproportionately benefit people in rural areas. For example, some of the assistive technology that we talked about last time we were in this room together um, might might I think it would benefit everyone across the state, but it might be a little bit more beneficial to folks in rural areas. But I think across the board. We were trying to support people across this room. I, I think our colleagues at DDS feel very much the same way. So I don't I don't think there there are really strong um, geographic patterns in in the added supports that we outline. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I am looking forward to seeing uh, in the future how these incentive payments have uh, to see some data um, because I do think that this could really uh, facilitate the goals of five thousand one. Um, and really would like uh, to have uh, DSS and DDS um, report to us going forward um, how this is working, because this might be something that we could put permanently um, going forward um, if it does work out and it is achieving the goal. So thank you very much for the indulgence, Madam Chair, and thank you again for your presentation. Thank you, Representative Datham. Um, it's funny, we were, Representative Nutri and I were just express, expressing this um, interest to see how the funds are allocated and um, maybe a report back to appropriations and human services so that we know how the money is being spent. Um, it will give us some ideas. One, how soon it can be turned around. I think that's going to be critical. Um, two, in what areas were the, the providers looking for support in the most? Because I think that'll help us in understanding what we need to do. And then three, when we do incentive payments, I guess my question would be on the incentive payments. First of all, we're talking about the enhanced dollars that will be used for the incentive payments. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And you think that it's about $14.5 million? Uh, $14.5 million is only the portion uh, in addition uh, because of the retroactive, our ability to recover the revenue retroactively. I think that's just in the retroactive window, Nick. So the $14.5 million is the amount from the initiatives presented to you today that we will gain in revenue if this Appendix K is approved. That money would be back to February 1st, but all the way through 
March of 2025. That's the extra revenue this would help us acquire. So the the fact that we are not looking to build it into the base that we are trying to use it during the short period of time, it'd be curious um, because bonus payments would be something that would be on the on the table, correct? Uh, we, I think we retention uh, bonuses. Yeah, uh, but they've... And, 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 uh, there's a couple of ways in which they can uh, get dollars to the direct care workforce. Uh, and I'm losing some of the language, but it, yes, it's a way to put money in people's pockets. Uh, one, to thank them for the hard work during um, COVID uh, and two, to provide workforce stability now. Okay. And then there'd be for um, facilities. Is that part of it too? Because we would be helping them to um, change the, the way we deliver services that are more independent. So it's going to have facility operational changes, correct? There, uh, thank you for the question. There are certain portions of money that allow us uh, to invest in property differently with regards to accessibility and technology. And I'm going to defer to my colleagues if there's any of the ARPA money available for capital expenditures. So that basically the funding that they receive, and as mentioned before, they may receive this funding both for moving someone out of one of these congregate settings or accepting them into a more independent setting. Um, it, when they're moving out of these congregate settings or these non-work-like settings, um, the provider is actually being paid a vacancy payment so that they can find an appropriate fit for someone to move in. With that money, they may want to figure out how they could adjust the congregate setting to better fit the needs of the rest of the population. And so some of that extra money that they're going to get for the person no longer in the home could be used to modify the facility. And then as far as the money they receive for accepting an individual, they're going to actually receive twice the amount they typically would receive. And with that extra money, they may use that money to modify or play it forward so that they can accept more individuals, open up more capacity in their home. Um, or their work, excuse me, their work-like setting. And you, if, you, if I may, Rep Walker, I just you, want to make sure that I, I that we're on the same page. The, the those additional uh, incentives, how they invest that money, um, they would have much discretion. But we would still there would still be an approval process through the department. That was going to be my next question. <laughs> We've been doing this together a while, Rep Walker. <laughs> so there will be an approval process. For how they spend the additional funds, yes, yes, sir. That would be part of their transformation plan, and and that's why we're trying to incentivize more transformation plans by paying them for those transformation plans, so they can outline their plan, not only where they're moving people out and how they're going to modify that setting, but where they're moving people to and what that setting is going to look like. Some providers may do it internally, and some providers may work together, where one's going to move someone out and the other's going to accept them, and that would be all part of those transformation plans. So you, I, I use a term that I don't. You, you said there would be incentives for or payments for vacancy. Yeah. So when an individual moves out of a setting right. through these plans, there's two sets of payments that that provider will qualify for. One is a payment while they're trying to find the fit for that, for that location. So whether it's someone off the wait list or someone internal, um, they're going to try to find the fit and we're going to pay them while they work on finding that fit especially if a provider is going to make a lot of movements. The first one may be easy to find the fit, but subsequent movements, it gets harder and harder to find the right fit. The second payment that that provider gets is once the person that moved out successfully transitions. Mm -hmm. So let's say the person moves out and they've been successful in their new place for 60 days. They actually get a bonus payment for that successful transition to show, okay, you moved the person out and it was a success. Our system has moved to where we want it to. And we want to make sure you're rewarded for I did not just identifying a person, but identifying a person that was a good fit for this type of movement. Okay, I, I I know we're talking about DDS, but it would be nice to try and utilize that same platform if possible for some of the other agencies, because when we have census review, we end up in some of the agencies just closing down facilities as opposed to allowing them to make shifts. And I hope this is not going to be a unique situation just for DDS but I hope we will be able to look at this to work with other providers like in Department of Children and Families or Department of Corrections who seem to have a hard time maintaining themselves. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, Guy, you have this puzzled look on your face. No, no, Rep, Rep Walker, I, I was just thinking about how that applies to DSS. Uh, so I'm listening carefully to your comments. DCF has 
direct dotted line to DSS. <laughs> For sure. So, okay. so I think right. it's I think it's important that th this flexibility that we have uh, been able to uh, utilize um, may demonstrate a model for future consideration, and I think that's what you're getting at. It's been a, it's a very rare opportunity uh, with CMS where we can uh, provide some of these opportunities, including paying for vacant beds to allow for a healthy transition and an opportunity if the transition doesn't work back to return to where you were. This is uh, historic in terms of uh, the flexibility CMS has given us, but I think that they are watching closely because if they, they, they may learn at the federal level that this is a better way to do business and we hope to demonstrate that here in Connecticut. I, I thoroughly agree with you. There's no question in my mind. I just know that um, many of the providers that are in the other agencies don't get that same sort of support or opportunity. And that creates havoc for us because the insecurity becomes very prominent in funding. So making us more sensitive to our nonprofits so that we can make sure, I think is a wonderful, wonderful thing to do. So. I look forward to the data that we're going to get because we're going to ask for that information as you go through it. So, so I guess that just says there are no more questions. <laughs> I want to know, is that connected to the capital over there? They say enough questions. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> all right. Thank you. Are there any other questions for anybody? Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you for your 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 testimony and your um, answers to our questions and comments. Very happy to do that. Looking forward to our continued work together. Thank you. <laughs> well, that concludes the public hearing that we have for us because I see no one else on there. Correct, Madam, Madam Administrator? Okay, so with that, I will conclude the uh, public hearing. Unplug that thing. Um, <laughs> I will conclude, this will conclude the public hearing and we will move into, into the, um, the committee meetings and we are, we are, ha we have today human services and appropriations and human services will go first. So I turn it over to the chairs of human services. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I call the meeting of the Human Services Committee to order, and I ask for a motion to approve the Appendix K Emergency Preparedness. Second. Second. All right, moved by Representative Case and seconded by Senator Lesser. Um, is there any discussion? Seeing none, could the clerk please call the roll? Representative Gilcrest. Yes. Senator Lesser. Yes. Senator Seminara. Yes. Representative Case. Yes. Senator Gaston. Representative Dathan. Representative Dathan is a yes. Senator Marr. Senator Marr is yes. Representative Butler. Representative Cook. Representative Exum. Representative Exum votes yes. Representative Fortier. Representative Fortier votes yes. Representative Hughes. Representative Hughes votes yes. Representative Johnson. Representative Johnson votes yes. Representative Kitt. Representative Kitt votes yes. Representative Leeper. Representative Leeper votes yes. Representative Santiago. Santiago votes yes. Representative Buckby. Representative Buckby votes yes. Representative Ferraro. Representative Ferraro votes yes. Representative Mastro Francesco. Representative Pizzuto. Representative Paletta. Are there any other members of the Human Services Committee that would like to cast a vote? Could the clerk please announce the tally?
Voting 21, the yeas are 15, nays zero, abstain zero, absent and on voting six. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. The Human Services Committee is now in recess. Thank you. I'd like to convene the Appropriations mm -hmm. Committee. Um, I'm asked for a motion and a second to approve the appendix so K moved. emergency. Second, second. Representative Dathan. Okay. We, we raced on ours, but let's see. I think I think it was moved by Senator Brothel and mm -hmm. it was it was seconded by a Representative Datham. Um, uh, what am I doing? Uh, are there is there any discussion? <laughs> No. Seeing none. No. Seeing none. <laughs> you gave up that ability. Uh, seeing none, Madam Administrator, would you please call the roll? Senator Austin. Senator Austin votes in the affirmative. Oh, she... Representative Walker. Representative Walker votes in the affirmative. Senator Hartley. Representative Exum. Representative Exum votes yes. Representative Paris. Representative Paris votes yes. Senator Berthel. Senator Berthel votes yes. Representative Nuccio. Representative Nuccio votes yes. Senator Anwar. Senator Anwar votes yes. Senator Anwar votes yes. I got you, sir. Thank you. Representative Baker. Representative Baker votes yes. Representative Belinsky. Representative Belinsky votes yes. Representative Callahan. Representative Callahan votes yes. Representative Candelaria. Representative Candelaria votes yes. Representative Cholesky. Representative Cholesky votes yes. Representative Curry. Representative Curry votes yes. Representative Dathan. Representative Dathan votes yes. Representative DiCaprio. Representative DiCaprio votes yes. Representative Delaney. Representative Delaney votes in the affirmative. Representative Delnicki. Yes. Representative Dillon. Yes. Representative Felipe. Senator Flexer. Senator Flexer votes yes. Representative Foncello. Representative Foncello votes yes. Representative Garibay. Representative Gibson. Representative Gilchrist. Representative Gilchrist votes yes. Senator Gordon. Representative Gonzalez. Gonzalez votes yes. Representative Haddad. Representative Haddad votes yes. Representative Hall. Representative Harrison. Yes. Representative Hoxa. Representative Hoxa votes yes. Representative Johnson. Representative Johnson votes yes. Representative Kana. Representative Kana votes yes. Representative Kennedy. Kennedy votes yes. Senator Kushner. Senator Kushner votes yes. Senator Lesser. Senator Lesser votes yes. Senator Marks. Senator Marks votes yes. Representative McCarty. Representative McCarty votes yes. Senator McCrory. Representative Nolan. Representative Porter. Representative Osborne. Representative Osborne votes yes, safely parked. Representative Reyes. Representative Reyes votes in the affirmative. Uh, need to see you, sir. I need your video on, Representative Reyes. I'm sorry, let me let me keep trying. Just just keep pass for now. Okay, I'll come back to you. 
Representative Rosario. Representative Rosario in the affirmative. One more time for me, please. Rep Representative Rosario in the affirmative. Ah, there you are. Thank you, sir. Representative Rutigliano. Yes. Representative Ryan. Representative Ryan votes yes. Representative Sanchez. Representative Sanchez votes yes. Senator Slap. Senator Slap votes yes. One more time. I didn't get your video. Senator Slap votes yes. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Sims. Representative Sims in the affirmative. Senator Summers. Representative Tersiak. Yes. Senator Winfield. Senator Winfield and the affirmative. Representative Zawistowski. Yes. Senator Hartley. Senator Hartley, I saw you. <laughs> Senator Hartley in the affirmative. Thank you, Madam Administrator. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Representative Felipe. Representative Garibay. Representative Gibson. Representative Gibson votes yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Senator Gordon. Representative Hall. Senator McCrory. Representative Nolan. Representative Nolan in the affirmative. Representative Porter. Senator Summers. Madam Clerk, Representative Garibay is here and votes in the affirmative, please. Thank you, ma'am. Madam Administrator, Representative Reyes in the affirmative, please. Thank uh, you. Nice to see you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Administrator, I think Representative Felipe is also on. Thank you, ma'am. Representative Felipe. Representative Felipe votes yes. Thank you, sir. Madam Administrator, may I have the tally? Total number voting 48. Those voting yay, 48. Those voting nay, zero. Those abstaining, zero. Those absent, not voting, five. Thank you. The matter passes. May I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? It's moved by Representative Berthel and seconded by Representative Paris. Uh, appropriations is adjourned. I'd like to call the meeting of the Human Services Committee back to order. And then I'd like to ask for a motion and a second to adjourn the meeting. Second. Moved by Representative Case and uh, seconded by Senator Lesser. The Human Services Committee meeting is adjourned. Oh, I forgot. Madam Administrator, the Appropriations Committee will convene again today because we like each other so much. What time and where will we be? We will be convening at 1 p.m. going straight into meetings. Okay. So there will not be caucuses at 1 o'clock. If there nope. are caucuses, there's... If they want them before, and we will be in room 2C. We'll be back home. We'll be back home. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I went with See everybody from a probes at one o'clock. <laughs>